get started, we always have a lot of people who join us through different media. Uh, we are live streaming all of our services. We have people who watch us in other places. I guess I should look at the camera as I say that. So thank you for, for watching. We have people who listen to our, our sermons uh, through our podcast and through the website. We're just, we just want to say welcome to everyone. We're so thankful that you're interested in spiritual things. And however you're here or in person or in some other way, uh, we just want you to know it's an encouragement to us as we study God's Word together. Thank you so much for being here this morning. John chapter 1, I want to begin by reading in the story in verse 43. John 1 and verse 43. The text says, The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open." and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. We can get to know people through stories. Very often, we study and listen to stories of great historical figures. Sometimes we'll go to movies to see those stories portray that character. But there are even people who, without ever hearing their voice or seeing their picture, we don't know what they look like, we don't know what they sounded like, we can get to know things about their character by listening to the things that they did. We learn them. And in that learning, we can often be blessed. We can be helped. And so what I want to do, in fact, I'm going to do this in five parts, five different lessons I plan on preaching, uh, looking through some of the stories of Jesus, revisiting those things to pursue five things about him. Now, I wish I could tell you that's going to go straight forward. We'll do one this week and one the next week and one the next week. But if you know anything about our schedule, it's that from week to week things change. So I'll just say over the coming weeks, uh, we're going to be studying those five things. That is my plan. And before I get into what we're going to talk about this morning, I want to answer the question, why would we study this? Why would we talk about Jesus in this way by focusing on the stories about him? So I want to do this because I believe it's important for us to know just how real Jesus is. That Jesus was a real person like you and me who went through real bouts of suffering and challenge, who interacted with real people, and we need to know just how real he is. I'm also going to teach these in a little bit of a different way. I'm going to tell these stories as stories because sometimes I think we need to step back and hear the beauty and the power of the story instead of just what we're going to call studying them. Now, you know, I'm not against Bible study. I'm very pro-Bible study. But I believe sometimes when we look at a story like the one we've just read and we start to dissect what this verb says and what exactly Nathaniel is, where is Nathaniel from, pretty soon we get lost and we can't see the forest for the trees. And I want us to be able to hear and see Jesus. Mainly, I want to answer the question in these lessons. If we were to meet Jesus personally, we were to sit across the table from him, or if we were to walk behind him, what would stick out about Jesus? What would it be like? What would we notice most about him? And then, I want to see how those most important attributes help you and me. How it helps us connect to our Savior, and how it helps transform us into someone who is like him. So what we're going to do this morning is talk about how Jesus is a faith magnet. Jesus is a faith magnet. What I mean by that, as you'll see, is that Jesus draws people to faith, and Jesus draws faith out of people. He is a magnet for faith. Some people affect us. You know, there are some people that make us negative or make us bitter. And when we're around them, we kind of feel worse for being around them. And then there are some people who affect us for the good. They bring out the best in us. They encourage us. We enjoy them. If you were to be around Jesus, Jesus would make you believe. 
That's the notable thing about him that I want to focus on this morning. When people were around Jesus, they turned their attention to things beyond this world. They turned their attention to God. Jesus helps you believe. So let's start by saying this. Jesus creates new faith. So this is our story we just read. In this story, Jesus is out by the Jordan River where John the Baptist has been preaching and baptizing. And some of John's disciples begin to follow Jesus. They begin to be interested in him because of what John says about him. And as they approach and go back to Galilee, Philip finds his buddy Nathaniel. And you need to understand about Nathaniel. Nathaniel is one of these guys who just says what he thinks and is very direct. And so when Nathaniel has Philip approach him and say, hey, we found the Messiah. They obviously have had a conversation about this before. He's excited. He said, really, what's his name? Jesus of Nazareth. And you can almost see Nathaniel's nose curl. Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? He knows people from Nazareth, and nothing good happens in Nazareth. And so Philip just says, come and see. And so as he approaches Jesus, Jesus says, now there's a real Israelite. Which is a really strange thing to say, right? Okay? He doesn't know Nathaniel at all. But he says, there is a real Israelite, no deceit in him. He doesn't lie about anything. And Nathaniel says, well, that, that's a pretty good description. And he says, how do you know me? And Jesus says, you know, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, I don't know what happened under the fig tree. I would be really curious to find out. Maybe someday we'll know that. But it's something that obviously only Nathaniel and Jesus know. And at that moment, Nathaniel is convinced. He says, Rabbi, you're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. And I see Jesus chuckling at this, like, really? Is that all it took? He said, you're going to see better stuff than that, Nathaniel. But you see what happens. In one conversation, really in two statements, Jesus takes Nathaniel from zero to belief. Because that's what he does. That's what Jesus consistently does. So one day, he walks by a man who has been blind from birth. When blind from birth, when you hear that, that means that there's no accident that caused his blindness. This is the way he's always been. He's never seen anything. And so he stops and he sees the man who is evidently begging. And he spits in the ground and makes mud with the spit and the dirt. And he puts it in the man's eyes and he says, Now, you need to go find this pool. It's called the Pool of Siloam. And go wash in the pool. And I wonder what the blind man is thinking when Jesus puts stuff on his eyes. And, uh, you know, it's probably kind of gross, especially he evidently knows what's happened. He knows he spit on the ground because he talks about it later. And then he puts, you know, mud spit on his eyes, spit mud on his eyes, and says, hey, go wash in this pool. He's got to go to a specific pool. Probably he has to be helped along and led there. But when he washes that spit mud off, which I know some of us would probably be more anxious to wash it off than others. He washes that off and finally he sees. So where he needed help to get there, maybe he doesn't even need help to get back. Probably he knew the streets of Jerusalem pretty well. But when he comes back, Jesus isn't there. So some of the people see him and recognize him and say, hey, weren't you the guy that was blind and was begging there? And he says, yeah, that's me. And they say, well, why don't we come talk to the Pharisees about it? Because after all, it's a Sabbath and something has happened on the Sabbath. So the Pharisees need to find out about it. And boy, when the Pharisees get involved, it, it's just ridiculous. They start doing this interrogation. And this blind man, the whole time, through this whole questioning inquisition process, he has one thing he keeps saying. Chris talked about this last week. One thing I know, I was blind and now I see. You can talk what you want about Jesus. I don't know Jesus. Here's what I know. I was blind, and now I see. And after this man is really roughly treated and cast out of the synagogue, Jesus comes and finds him. I love that Jesus comes and finds him afterward. And he simply says, do you believe in the Son of Man? And the man says to him, knowing that this is Jesus, he says, who is he? I don't know who he is. Tell me who he is, and I'll believe in it. And Jesus says, well, it's me. He says, Lord, I believe, and he worships him. He bows down in front of him. You see what happens in this story? The man moves from no faith to faith in Jesus. In fact, I think if Jesus had said, 
the Son of Man is Peter over there. The man would say, okay, I believe in Peter then. Whoever you tell me to believe in, I'm going to believe in because I believe in you. That's what Jesus does. Jesus creates new faith. He is a faith magnet. One day, Jesus gets out of the boat, and there is a man who begins to scream at him. And the man is quite a sight. He is either having tattered clothes or maybe completely naked. He's got cuts all over his body, probably stinks. He's been living in a graveyard, after all. And the man has an unclean spirit. And the reason he's screaming at Jesus is because the spirit recognizes Jesus. But just imagine what it would be like to be one of those disciples there. And all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're just getting out of the boat and this guy starts screaming at Jesus. What have we to do with you? Don't torment us. But all you can see is the man. And so Jesus seems to have a conversation with the man who seems lucid in this moment enough to talk with him. What's your name? Legion, for we are many. Please don't cast us into the abyss. Let us go into the pigs. But all you would notice is this. If you were sitting there next to Jesus, you would notice Jesus say, come out of him. And you would hear the man beg, please don't send us into the abyss. And he would say, you can go into the pigs. And then what you would notice, do you know what you would notice? Those pigs would start acting crazy. Going crazy, running around, and then eventually running into the water and drowning themselves. By the time you turn around from watching the pigs, you would see this man who had been screaming at Jesus. Somebody got him some clothes. And he's sitting there in his right mind. In fact, he says, Jesus, can I go with you? And Jesus says, no, you go home and tell everybody what the Lord has done for you. This man moves from possessed by Satan to now an evangelist for Jesus. Jesus creates new faith. Can I explain a little bit about how that works? Jesus opens people up to supernatural explanations. Jesus does things that require or demand some kind of explanation beyond what we know. Whether that's knowledge, whether that's the power to heal, whether that's the power to cast out demons, whatever it is, when Jesus acts, people desperately search for a way to explain it. I mean, that's what we would all do, right? You see something amazing, you say, well, how did that work? And you can hear their thought processes. Here's Nathaniel, how do you know me? Here are the disciples, what kind of man is this? Here is the blind man, one thing I know, I was blind and now I see, I don't know the rest of it, I don't understand it all, but I know something has happened. And then when Jesus sees that and he, he begins that questioning process, then he points people to God. I think it's notable that he does that. Remember when Jesus tells ten lepers, go show yourself to the priest, and as they go, they're cleansed, and one comes back? He doesn't come back to say, thank you, Jesus, although surely he says that, hopefully. He comes back specifically to give glory to God. He knows God has done this, that Jesus is the agent, God is responsible. Here is Jesus coming to the tomb of Lazarus, and he prays, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. What I'm about to do is God's work and not just mine. Jesus says there has to be another explanation, and then he says God is the other explanation. That creates faith. So, when Jesus creates new faith, the goal is to get people to believe in the absence of miracles in the absence of signs. There will be a time when the miracles stop. What's going to happen then? Jesus wants to create a faith that will last even when there's not miracles to buoy it. So, for example, he says at one point, as he is on his way to heal the daughter of Jairus, he says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Sort of a sad comment, isn't it? I want you to believe without the signs and wonders. Or he says to Thomas, John 20, verse 29, Have you believed because you have seen? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I think sometimes we forget the fact that not everybody who lived in this time, in the time of the New Testament, saw Jesus. In fact, most people didn't see him and didn't see his miracles. Christians have always been by and large, people who have not seen and yet have believed. 
Because that's what Jesus is after, connecting people to God even without those supernatural events that defy explanation. Jesus also does this, by the way, with his teaching. We won't go into this as much. But it seems to me that Jesus gives questions that provoke deeper questioning and insight into our own lives. Jesus will say things like, Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? By the way, that is a great question. Don't you think there's more to life than eating? Surviving? Doesn't moth and rust destroy your money? Or we would say today, doesn't money kind of go away? Don't you feel sometimes like sheep without a shepherd? Don't you feel sometimes like you don't know what to do? And you need somebody to help you? Jesus keys in on that. What he says is, you need something besides what you have. You need God. And so he creates faith by probing us and pushing us toward God. Second, Jesus is a faith magnet because Jesus draws out faith. I think what's most impressive about the stories of Jesus is that all kinds of people come to believe in him. And when they see him, all kinds of people come to him. Different kinds of people believe, and they're willing to do all kinds of things to express that faith. Just, I'm thinking like a magnet here, just run Jesus through the town and see who comes out. Let me give you some examples of that. Here's Jesus. He's in a house teaching, and he's in one of those times in his ministry where there are so many people who are excited about him that they've gathered in the house, and the house is packed. Can't even get in. And you've got a small group of people who they have one big problem. They have a friend who's paralyzed. And they think Jesus might be able to heal him, but they can't get to Jesus. They've heard he's in town. They rush to get their friend, and it's already crowded. One of them has this crazy idea. Do you have one friend that has crazy ideas? He says, let's just go in through the roof. And I just picture them all laughing for a minute. And then they say, well, we've got some rope. We could probably make it work. And they go up, and I don't know exactly how it works, but most roofs in this time were made of some kind of combination of earth, mud, and some kind of tile or something like that. So they find a way to start opening the roof. And just picture being in that room with Jesus, and the light starts coming in through the ceiling. And then, you know, the, the dirt starts dropping down. I mean, it's not as if this was secret. Everything's going to stop because everybody's wondering what's going on on the roof. And then, finally, they get the opening wide enough and they start lowering the guy in. And it says, Jesus, when he saw their faith, said, son, your sins are forgiven you. What kind of people does Jesus draw to him? He draws the kind of people who will do ridiculous things. Because they truly believe God can help them. They want God to help their friend, and they're willing to look like fools to make it happen. Jesus draws out that kind of faith. You just run him through the town. See what comes out. Jesus passes through Jericho, and there is a man, as he's going literally through the streets of the city, a blind beggar who is sitting by the road. And he hears Jesus is coming, and so he starts shouting. I don't know what else he could do. I don't know if he didn't have anybody who would be uh, sort of a representative for him, but he just says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. They tell him, shh, Jesus is coming, be quiet. And so he gets louder. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And finally, Jesus stops. I just picture them walking through the city and then, what? They call him to him. What do you want me to do for you, Lord, that I may receive my sight? And Jesus says, according to your faith, let it be done to you. Jesus says the word. And you know what happens after that? The man follows him. Of course he follows him. Wouldn't you follow the guy who made you see? But it's not that the man didn't have any faith before. He believed Jesus could heal him. It's that Jesus drew that faith out and he made it stronger. And now that man's ready to do more. That's what Jesus does. He is a faith magnet. At one point, Jesus leaves Israel, and he goes briefly into Canaanite territory, actually Tyre and Sidon. And there is a Canaanite woman who is there, whose daughter has a, a demon. And this is a very, very interesting thing, because this is a time when Jesus seems really rude. And she approaches Jesus. Help me, help me heal my daughter. 
And Jesus just ignores her, pretends he doesn't hear. And the disciples, I mean, it's obvious everybody hears her because the disciples say to Jesus, can you just ask her to leave? This is really annoying. Can you just say something? And Jesus says to them, in her hearing, I don't heal non-Jews. It's not why I was sent. Not my problem. So then, she comes and kneels down in front of him. He can't ignore her anymore. And she kneels down in front of him and she says, Lord, help me. She has abandoned all pretense of trying to, you know, uh, maintain appearances here. doesn't matter if she looks embarrassed. And finally, Jesus speaks to her and he says simply this. I just picture him looking down at her, kneeling in front of her and saying, this isn't right. You don't take children's bread and give it to dogs. And the woman says, she doesn't seem to miss a beat. Yes, but dogs can eat the crumbs. And Jesus finally, it's almost like he drops the act. And again, I picture him kind of chuckling. Woman, great is your faith. You, you have it. Let it be what you want. And he heals her daughter. Now, Jesus treats this woman this way, my belief. Not because Jesus is rude, and not just because Jesus has some kind of racial bias or something like that. Jesus treats this woman this way because Jesus draws out faith. What begins as a hope, you know what, maybe he can help. Then becomes something more and more and more intense. And Jesus says, what are you willing to do? What are you willing to put up with? How far are you willing to go? And the faith is drawn further and further out so that by the end of this story, great is your faith, he says. It is staggering when you read the stories of Jesus how many different kinds of people are willing to believe that God can act to help them. All kinds of people. They will risk embarrassment and disappointment because they know Jesus can help them. Just walk Jesus through a city and see what happens. Walk him through a city and you'll have a leper come up to him and say, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Walk Jesus through a city and you'll have a woman who says, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I can be made well. Walk him through a city and a centurion will approach him and say, just say the word and my servant will be healed. Over and over again, Jesus draws out faith from even surprising places. The other thing about Jesus in this way is that Jesus draws out faith by showing just how many different kinds of people want to have a spiritual conversation. Have you ever noticed that sometimes we think nobody's interested in God, nobody wants to talk about spiritual things, everybody's just after their own things. When you talk to Jesus, you talk about spiritual things. And a lot of people are willing that we wouldn't expect. Jesus sits down at a well, and the woman who comes just to do her daily chores ends up having a long spiritual conversation with Jesus that changes her life. Jesus sits down to eat with tax collectors and sinners. What do you think they talked about? Think they talked about how much fun it is to sin? Now, when they talk to Jesus, they're going to talk about what Jesus is interested in talking about, which is God. Jesus talks with women. Jesus talks with centurions. Gentiles approach him and say, we want to see Jesus. In fact, have you noticed that while Jesus is dying on a cross between two thieves, one of the thieves says, hey, can we have a spiritual conversation right now? Remember me when you come into your kingdom. It is amazing to me. Jesus sees the world this way. That those around him are like sheep without a shepherd, harassed and helpless. They need help. Jesus says, guys, open your eyes. The fields are white for harvest. There are people everywhere who have faith or the beginnings of faith or they're walking toward faith. And all that's required is for us to help draw them out. Jesus describes that process like a man sowing seed in his garden. You know, you can look at soil and tell a lot about it. You can usually tell if it's very good or not. But the true test of whether a soil is good for crops is when you throw the seed on it. See what happens. And Jesus so embodies the word that he teaches that everywhere he goes, people respond to him in whatever way they would respond to God. They show whether they truly have the good and honest heart he's seeking. Jesus draws out faith 
There are different levels of faith, have you noticed? Like some people are willing to believe that God is real. And that's a level of faith. But there is another level at which people begin to believe that maybe God could do something today on earth. God could invade into humanity. God could in some way affect our lives. That's a different level of faith. Then there is faith. That as they look at this man who looks just like you and me, he's just a man. They say that man is from God. The things that he's doing are God's works. And then there is faith. That's another level deeper that says, because I see what he's doing, he is more than a man. He is from God. He is God's son. He is God's Messiah, God's Savior. And then, this is even deeper, there is a level of faith that says, because I believe in God and God intervening and God intervening through this man and God intervening through sending his son, now I know I can trust him. Another level of faith. Jesus draws out. At whatever level people are willing to believe, Jesus draws out that faith. And the third thing I want to say about this is that Jesus deepens faith. See, this is what he does. He not only creates the faith, he also draws out the faith. And here, he pushes that faith to grow deeper and deeper and deeper. You just couldn't be around Jesus and miss the spiritual dimension of life. You would either deepen your faith or you would walk away. You would not stay the same. Because Jesus pushes us to grow deeper. That's the reason for one of the most common expressions. I think if we were one of Jesus' disciples while he was on earth, this is what we would have heard probably most often. Because he says it to his disciples a number of times in the Gospels. The phrase is, O oh, you of little faith. Little faiths. That's what Jesus called his disciples, by my count, about six times. So, Jesus is sitting on the mountain, and he says, don't be anxious about your life. Look at the birds. I wonder if there were birds around. So look at the birds. They don't worry. They don't work. God takes care of them. Is he not going to take care of you? Or he says, look at the flowers. Surely there were flowers around. He says, you know, they don't work. And God gives them clothes. Won't he clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. Jesus pushes them toward deeper thought about their lives and about the God who cares for them. He doesn't want them to remain at the level where they believe in God, but they're not sure they can trust him. He says, grow deeper, you little faiths. One time they're in the boat. And there's a storm. Jesus is asleep. And the boat begins to fill up with water. And the disciples just panic. It's time. This is the one. We're going to die. We're not making it to land. And they wake Jesus up, and they're kind of shouting at him, Don't you care that we're about to die? And Jesus says, Why are you afraid, you little faiths? Another time they're on the water. Jesus walks to them on the surface of the water. Of course, they're all terrified. When they realize who it is, Peter says, can I come out to you on the water? If it's really you, let me come out. Jesus says, come on. And Peter begins to walk to Jesus on the water. And he begins to look around and see the, just what he's doing, I'm guessing. See the wind, see the waves. And he begins to sink. And Jesus says to him, you little faith, why did you doubt? Is Jesus insulting him? I don't believe so. I don't believe Jesus is trying to be negative. I believe Jesus is saying, get deeper. Don't be satisfied with where you are. You've done something awesome. Now it can go further. Once they are in the boat, and the disciples have forgotten to bring lunch. And I just picture Jesus as they're in the boat. He's, he's looking out over the water. It's just my picture, by the way. This is in the Bible. He's, he's over the water. He's thinking about the fact that they just had this interaction with the Pharisees and Sadducees, and, and he's contemplative, thinking about, what can I say to these guys? And they're panicking. We didn't bring any lunch. What are we going to do? And Jesus says, you know, you need to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they say, oh no, he knows we didn't bring any food. And Jesus just seems, to, are you kidding? Do, do you not know that I can handle the food? 
You remember 5,000? Remember five loaves, two fish? You remember? Okay, do you remember? And he really he goes through them all. Don't you remember? Don't you know that I could care less if you didn't bring any food? And he says, don't you understand, you little faiths? I want to be specific here. Jesus does not call unbelievers little faiths. He's not making fun of people. He's challenging them. He's saying, grow deeper and reach out and trust God and don't be afraid and don't be anxious. Don't be shallow. Get deeper. One time a ruler of the synagogue comes to Jesus and his daughter is sick and about to die. She's about 12 years old. And as Jesus goes with the crowd toward the man's house, first he's interrupted because this woman wants to touch the hem of his garment. He's got to go through all of that. And as they're doing that, someone comes from the house and says, don't bother him anymore. She died. And Jesus turns to the man and he says, do not fear, only believe. Just trust. Go deeper. The man already believes. He's already come to Jesus because he believes in Jesus. He is saying, don't let this hinder your faith. Get stronger in your faith. One time a man comes to Jesus because his son has a demon. And he talks about how the demon has always tormented his son. Trying to throw him into the fire and throw him into the water. Can you imagine parents having a child that any time you turn your back, they're going to try to die because they have a demon in them? And the, the torment that would be for you? And he comes to Jesus and he says these words. You probably heard them in like a hospital setting. He says, Jesus, if you can do anything, can you help us? And Jesus says, if you can, all things are possible for him who believes. And the man says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. He understands Jesus is challenging him. Go deeper. Believe more. Reach out. At the tomb of Lazarus, Martha says, Jesus, don't, don't roll the stone away. He's been dead four days. He's going to stink. And Jesus says, didn't I tell you, if you would believe, you would see the glory of God. When Jesus curses a fig tree and it withers, he turns to his disciples and he says, have faith in God. If you say to this mountain, be thrown in the sea, it will be done. Do you see it? Deeper, deeper, deeper. Jesus is challenging and pushing more audacious faith, more trust in God, less worry, less fear. God is real. God is here. God can help. Have faith in God. But the tragedy of Jesus' life is that not everybody wants to go deeper. And there are people who approach him. And they sound like they're ready to go all the way with Jesus. There is one man who comes to Jesus, and he is so enthusiastic that he runs to him, and he kneels down in front of him, and he says, teacher, what do I need to do to have eternal life? And I think if we were sitting there, we would say, Jesus seems unimpressed, because Jesus just gives a stock answer. First, he says, why do you call me good? God's the only one who's good. Uh, just keep the commandments. You'll be fine. I almost picture him turning away because later on Mark is going to say he looked at him. And the man is just not satisfied with that answer. Keep the commandments. So I, I, maybe he tugs on Jesus' sleeve again. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I've done all of that. I've kept those commandments from my youth. And he asks a question that I think is very telling. He says, what do I still lack? What else is there? What am I missing? And Jesus turns and looks at him piercing look and he says one thing you lack go sell all your stuff give it to the poor and come follow me and the man is speechless he doesn't know what to say to that I'm sure whatever he had expected Jesus to say this was the last thing Jesus says, if you want to have the kind of faith you need to have eternal life, you've got to get deeper. And some people don't want to get deeper. 
One man approaches Jesus and he says, I'll follow you wherever you go. And he says, well, will you? Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests. I don't have anywhere to lay my head. You ready for that? One man comes and he says, Lord, I'll follow you, but I need to go bury my father first. And Jesus says, let the dead bury their dead. One man says, I'll follow you, but I need to go say goodbye to everybody at my house. Jesus says, no one, having put his hand to the plow, looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. What's he doing in those stories? He sounds really harsh, doesn't he? He sounds like he's being ugly to everybody. Jesus is challenging us to give it all up and follow him completely. That's the challenge. Will we be willing to go deeper with Jesus? We all, every one of us, everyone in this room, we all have areas in our lives that are struggle to give up. We have the dark parts of our lives, and we have the things that are hard to turn away from, and the things that are our unique struggles. And Jesus says, in every case, let it go, give it up, and come follow me. Deepen your faith. Jesus never wants us to be lukewarm. But if you were focused on money, or you were focused on people and what they thought of you, you really wouldn't want to be around Jesus for too long. Because Jesus views that kind of focus as hostile to faith. He says faith is going to require us getting deeper and pleasing God. Jesus is a faith magnet. He creates new faith. He draws out faith. He deepens faith. I want to ask for just a moment here, how does this help us? First of all, this helps us because Jesus teaches us to look beyond everyday life. Jesus teaches us to ask questions like, what can I learn here about God? How can I see God's hand in the things around me? Jesus challenges us to think that my life is more, please hear me, my life is more than continuing to breathe and work and survive for another day or another week or another year. That my life is about a purpose that I have that relates to God. How can God impact the world around me? How can God take care of me? How can God use me? What does God want me to do? Those are questions Jesus teaches us to do. And as we do that, as we look beyond our everyday lives, suddenly our faith is growing. We're thinking on a different dimension. Second, Jesus teaches us to grow deeper. He shows that we can't be content with whatever level we are at right now. That he wants us to push to remain hungry, to grow closer to God. And that the way we do that is sometimes by being challenged. Sometimes we need to be challenged to reach out to God, to ask for bigger and better things. Sometimes we need to be challenged to give up the things that are standing between us and God. Sometimes we need to be challenged to think on a different level or to use the time that we have not just for ourselves, but that challenge is intended to bless us. Jesus is behind it when we're challenged to grow deeper. Third, Jesus teaches us we can't predict where we'll find faith. We have a stubborn habit of thinking that we can evaluate people and how they're going to respond to the gospel. We can pick them out. Don't know how we think that or why, but we think, well, that guy, he'll obey, but no, he won't. Jesus teaches us that we would have gotten most of the stories in the gospel wrong. Isn't that interesting? Jesus says some of the strongest faith is found in some of the oddest places. And I especially want to say this. Please listen. People around us are hungry for God. You can't read the stories of the Gospels and miss it. And I don't believe that's changed. Not sure. The way that manifests may look different in 2019 than it did in the first century. I understand that. But please don't think no one's interested. No one will have this conversation with me. No one cares about faith anymore. That is simply not true. Our job is not to bemoan the state of our world. Our job is simply to try to draw faith out of people like Jesus. So, our duty is to serve in our own way as a magnet for faith with others. That means I need to be ready to have spiritual conversations with the people I encounter. I need to be the kind of person that when they're around me, they can't help but come to faith or else walk away. I need to be the kind of person that draws the faithful or the potential believer to myself, like Jesus. And finally, Jesus teaches us to trust God. 
to trust his power to help us, to trust his goodness, that he wants what's best for us, to trust his words and his promises, that he's going to do what he said, and to trust his teachings. Jesus teaches us that God is worthy of your trust and that God is there to help you. And if we can come out of reading the stories of Jesus with a deeper trust in God, we will be blessed for it. Now, I don't know where you are as you sit in the audience this morning in your journey toward faith. But I do know this. Jesus is a faith magnet. And for centuries, humanity has been enamored with Jesus, fascinated by Jesus. The question you need to answer this morning is, do you need to respond to him in faith? Jesus came so that we could have forgiveness of our sins through faith in him. That he who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. And if you're ready to put your faith in him as the Messiah, the Son of God, and to be baptized for the remission of your sins, we'd love nothing more than to help you do that this morning. If you need to come, please come right now.